Hello, and welcome back to Introduction to Genetics and Evolution. In the previous video, we talked about trying to identify differences between species, focusing on humans and chimps in particular, that may have spread by the action of natural selection, and contrasting those with ones that may have spread by drift. There are several challenges associated with this. Uh, what, the way we address these challenges is by contrasting non-synonymous changes and synonymous changes. So this is looking specifically at protein coding genes. So non-synonymous differences are the ones, you know, nucleotide differences, that will change the amino acid that goes into the final protein. So these non-synonymous differences may be positively selected, they may be advantageous or good, and therefore they spread quickly within one of the species. They may be negatively selected or, or under purifying selection. That means that they're basically like bad mutations. So they arise, they may stick around for a little bit, but largely selection is trying to eliminate them. Or they may be neutral. They may arise, they may change the protein, but not particularly change anything about fitness. In that case, they bebop around within the population. In contrast, synonymous changes do not affect the final amino acid. So those are considered to be largely, though not completely, neutral. So what we do when we're trying to infer the action of natural selection is to try to scale the number of non-synonymous changes, which is sort of the experimental group, with the number of synonymous changes. These are the ones that are thought to accumulate neutrally. So again, we can use them to scale for possible mutation rate differences at different genes. So we're looking for the ratio of non-synonymous to synonymous differences to estimate this. Specifically, in this case, we'll focus on the measure referred to as dn over ds. Now, these are not just number of non-synonymous differences, but dn is the number of non-synonymous changes per non-synonymous site. Okay? DS is number of synonymous changes per synonymous site. You may remember I mentioned that the second position of every codon is always non-synonymous. So there's no opportunity for any change there to be synonymous. So we have to use this kind of extra scaling even within our measures of what's happening in terms of non-synonymous and what's happening in terms of synonymous. Well, let's try this out. So what we have here are two DNA sequences, each with four codons. Okay. So this, let's say this top one is human, just as an example. The bottom one is chimp. Now, uh, so this is, these, are the, these are the sequences. These are the DNA sequences, or the RNA. These are the resulting amino acids that would, be, that would come from them. So we see there, there is an amino acid difference here in that last one, and it's probably resulting from this nucleotide difference. These two other variable sites are not actually changing the amino acids, because we see that this one's ACT, this one's ACG, but they're both, they both have three amino. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through site by site. So we have 12 different nucleotide sites here. We want to do two things. We want to classify each site as being something that could potentially cause a non-synonymous difference or could potentially cause a synonymous difference. We're going to walk through site by site. We're going to tally it up. We want to see how many potential synonymous differences we could have, how many potential non-synonymous differences we have. And then we'll contrast with that with the number of actual synonymous differences and non-synonymous differences. So let's start walking through. So looking at ACT versus ACG, what would happen in terms of this first site here? What would happen if we were, let's start with this sequence. Let's say that we started with ACT, here it is in our codon table. If we change that first base to anything else, if it became CCT, TCT, or GCT, what would happen? Well, if we, if we did any of those things, it would actually change the amino acid. TCT is a serine, CCT is a proline, GCT is alanine. So we classify this first site as a non-synonymous site, okay? Because any change from A gives a different amino acid. This is a clear non-synonymous site. So I mentioned before, all second positions are non-synonymous sites. Any second position change will change the amino acid. So this is definitely a non-synonymous site. And the third position in this case is a synonymous site because any change here, you know, if it's T, G, it doesn't matter what it is. If you're starting with AC, any change there will not affect the amino acid. So that is a clear synonymous site. So what we do is we tally up for this entire sequence how many potential synonymous changes were there, how many potential non-synonymous changes were there. And what we see is the total number of synonymous sites is four. It's just the total of these numbers. The total number of non-synonymous sites is eight. Now you may be wondering, what about bases where some changes affect amino acid and some changes don't? So one example would be like this one, TTT. If you started with a TTT, which is a phenylalanine, you could change from TTT to TTC, and that's still phenylalanine, but if you change that third nucleotide to a G or an A, it becomes a leucine. 
So that's a little bit trickier how you deal with those, but it's not so bad. Essentially what you do is if you're starting with TTG, your third position has a one-third probability of being synonymous, and a two-thirds probability of changing to a non-synonymous. So what you do is you add both those totals into those amounts. So in the synonymous column, where I had like the zeros and then the one, you just put a third. In the non-synonymous columns, where I had one, one, zero, you just make that one a two-thirds. Okay, so it's fairly straightforward. I'm not gonna give you problems like that here in this online course, but I just wanted you to know what would happen in that case. So again, we have this four synonymous sites, eight uh, non-synonymous sites. When we look at the changes we actually have, we actually have two synonymous changes. This is one synonymous change, this is the other, and we have one non-synonymous change, which is that one right there. And we do not, we're not necessarily showing a direction. We're not saying it changed from C to T. It may have changed from T to C. We don't actually know, but we're just calling these differences. Now, what we want to do is we want non, uh, DN over DS. DN is non-synonymous changes over non-synonymous sites. DS is synonymous changes over synonymous sites. So let's put those together. DN is non-synonymous changes, which is 1 over non-synonymous sites, which is 8. So 1 eighth or 0.125. DS is 2 out of 4, synonymous changes over synonymous sites, or 0.5. So DN DS would just be this number divided by that number, which would be, in this case, 0 0.25, which is a fairly typical DN DS value that you might find. Now, you might wonder, what does this mean? So what does any DNDS value mean? Well, this is estimating how much non-neutral or non-synonymous evolution has happened relative to neutral or synonymous evolution. Well, if a gene is evolving truly neutrally, if it really just didn't matter what differences you saw, if anything was equally okay in terms of fitness, we expect a DNDS value close to one, right? That's not at all what we saw, but we expect the DNDS value close to one. So this is saying there's no selection on non-synonymous changes. There's no bad, there's no good, that basically they're just like the neutral ones. In that case, you would actually have more non-synonymous changes than synonymous changes, but since you have more non-synonymous sites, it factors that out. So this would be what's happening in terms of neutrality. Another possibility is that you have DNDS well below one. That means that changes have been constrained. This is very typical. In this case, most non-synonymous changes that arise have been selected against. So we mentioned before with that flu virus example, this is pretty typical. You can also have DNDS greater than one. This is less, less common, but quite interesting. What happens in this case is you're having very rapid changes that basically within a single gene, you're having multiple non-synonymous changes favored by the action of natural selection. That's really cool when you see that, and that is very strongly indicative of strong recurrent positive selection. So let me show you a plot. Here's DNDS values between humans and chimps. So the average DNDS across the genome is 0.23. So that, there you go, that, that 0.25 we saw was fairly typical. There are 585 genes out of 13,000 that were tested that have a DNDS value greater than one. So these are the ones that are undergoing recurrent positive selection. So that's very exciting. These are often genes involved with, in resistance to parasites or fertilization. These are ones that you would expect to undergo rapid recurrent evolution. And this figure just shows you a sliding gene window. You see these little peaks here, like for example, the epidermal differentiation complex seems to be associated with a very high DNDS value. Well, let me give you one to try yourselves here in an in-video uh, quiz. So try this. This is the ASPM gene, which affects brain size in humans. And I have here a set of sequences. I want you to go through and calculate what the DNDS value would be. Okay, well, let's check this out and see what you guys got. So what we want here is we want to look at non-synonymous sites, synonymous sites, so let's do the sites, and then we'll look at the actual changes. Now, the changes, I'll go ahead and just highlight those so you can see them. These are the bases that are actually different in each case. I think that's it. Okay, so when you look at non-synonymous sites, uh, what I did, just to make it simple, these are all uh, sort of typical codons where the first and second position are non-synonymous, and third position is synonymous. Okay? So this would be 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. So these are all typical ones. You can look up the actual codons there. GTA, if you change it to GTC or GTG or anything like that, it's all the same. If you change the middle one, it's always non-synonymous. And these first ones, the ones I picked, are ones that if you change that first base, it would actually change the, the um, amino acid. So these are the sites. Now we look at the actual changes. 
Well, actually, let's total these up first. In terms of non-synonymous sites, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. For synonymous, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we have 5 synonymous sites, 10 non-synonymous sites. When we look at changes, we have 2, this one, and this one that are non-synonymous. And synonymous, we have 1. Okay? So our dn over ds, so dn will be equal to non-synonymous changes over non-synonymous sites. So that'd be 2 over 10, which is equal to 0 0.2. Our ds is equal to 1 over 5, which is equal to 0 0.2. So our dn over ds is very easy to calculate in this case. It would be 0.2 divided by 0 0.2, or it would be 1. So what does that tell you? What, and this comes back to the question of what a DNDS value really means. The real DNDS for ASPM is actually 0.9. So that one was actually not too far off. So is it likely this gene is actually evolving neutrally? This gene that affects brain size in humans? Is it very likely that any amino acid change to this gene has no fitness effect whatsoever? You can change it in any way, shape, or form. No, it's really very unlikely that these amino acid changes, any amino acid change there really don't matter. What's probably happening instead is we're having a combination of both constraint and rapid evolution within the same gene. That there are some nucleotide changes there that are being rapidly selected out, but there are some that are actually beneficial and they're going through. When you have both of those together, your DNDS value is taking this kind of average across the whole gene. So when you have constraint and rapid evolution together, it's kind of hard to tell what's going on. And this muddies how you can do a single generalization about a gene as a whole. And some people will actually break up the gene and look at sections of it independently. But this comes back to this broader question of what these DNDS values mean. That essentially, if you have a DNDS value of 1, that doesn't mean the gene is actually evolving neutrally. It means you cannot reject neutrality. And in fact, realistically, it's unlikely that almost any protein coding gene would be really evolving totally neutrally. It's very improbable. It could happen, but it's very improbable. So if you have DNDS less than one, you may still have some adaptive changes in there, but you have, importantly, lots of constraint. That most changes that come up there are bad and they're taken out. Most amino acid changes are disfavored. Similarly, if you have DNDS greater than one, then you definitely have selection driving rapid change. You probably have some constraint as well. Probably not any possible change is good, but probably a subset of them are bad, but you have nonetheless had multiple amino acid changes favored. So what's happening here is you're basically looking at an average of an evolutionary process when you're looking at the single DNDS value. So you can tell that there's been a lot of constraint or a lot of rapid evolution, or you just can't tell. That's really what it comes down to. Well, this is not entirely satisfying, as you can tell. We basically need another test. Because DNDS can end up being a little bit too conservative, especially if you're looking for those adaptive amino acid changes, that high DNDS value. You'll have way too many false negatives. So in the next video, we'll look at a test that is a little bit better at catching these kinds of adaptive amino acid changes. It's referred to as the McDonald-Kreitman test. Hope you'll join us. Thank you.